Good day, one and all, and welcome to another study session. And we sincerely hope wherever you are that you're enjoying the Lord's blessing. So we want to wish everyone who are currently in the Sabbath, a blessed Sabbath, and those that are not in the Sabbath, we still want to wish you a blessed day, a blessed week. We're about to commence our study. And the study today that we'll be looking at is revival and reformation, especially as it relates to our life and our Sabbath studies and our working for the church. How will we accomplish a genuine revival and reformation? Now we're going to go to a study and we will have a prayer thought. And after which we will commence. Our prayer thought is taken from 1SM, so let's get message. And we're reading page 127. And we're reading from the third paragraph. And the reading states the following. A revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. So this revival and reformation, it has to be guided. It has to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. If it's not controlled by the Holy Spirit, it's not revival and reformation. The reading continues. Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of mind and heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. So that's what revival is, a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of the mind. Now, reformation, on the other hand, signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories, habits and practices. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the spirit. Revival and reformation are to do their appointed work. And in doing this work, they must blend. So revival and reformation are two separate things. One has to come before the other. And reformation will not bring forth the fruit of the good fruit of righteousness unless it's connected with revival. So that will be our discussion for the remainder of the time that we'll be spending. And we are going to pause and say a word of prayer to commence. Heavenly Father, we pray that your presence will be among us and that you will bless us and guide us and keep us. You've promised where two or three are gathered Touching anything in your name, there will you be in the midst to bless. And we know that you are not one to lie. So we pray that you will bless us and be with us. And we want to thank you for the medium of Zoom, where we can connect with each other. And so we pray that you will bless our time together now. To Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No. We will continue. And now, as we look at revival and reformation, the first thing that we are going to spend some time looking at is revival. Revival. Now, if someone should 
meet in a car accident or they suffer some health crisis, they have a heart attack or something, your objective or anyone's objective is, try to, is to try to revive them. Now, the individual cannot revive themselves. It's impossible for the individual to actually revive themselves. So revival is an act that the individual has to get help to undertake or to come back to themselves. The person cannot just revive themselves like that. There needs to be some external force to help someone to revive. So this is just an illustration of what revival is or attempting to revive someone. Now, sometimes you can attempt to revive someone and they might not be revived. Someone might be joining and you pull them out of the pool or the water. You try to administer CPR. You try to revive them. You try to get them back to life, to get them up and about. So you have an idea of what revival is about. And as I said before, to be revived, you need help. People cannot revive themselves. It doesn't work like that. And so some second party or parties have to get involved to try to revive or attempt to revive the person. So in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 7, page 284, paragraph 4, inspiration made the following statement. Everyone needs now to seek the Lord. God's people will not endure the test. God's people will not endure the test unless there is a revival and reformation. So whatever test is coming, God's people cannot be victorious or be saved through that test unless there is a revival and a reformation. The Lord will not admit into the mansions he is preparing for the righteous one soul who is self-sufficient. So for someone to be revived, self has to be dying. And the person will see that they're in need to be revived. So the self-sufficient can never be revived. We should understand that. That should be clear. So, since the sense of sufficient cannot be revived, and we cannot make it into heaven without revival and reformation, we need revival first. No. When a person is revived, I say they had a heart attack, and someone administered some form of CPR, and they were able to come back to life. No. That person, when they go to the doctor, the doctor will talk to them and the doctor will say to them, no, you have been revived. And you now, having been revived, need to make some changes in your life. The changes that you need to make in your life are these changes that we recommend so based on the test that we've carried out on you, you need to reform. You're eating too much sugar. You're eating too, you're drinking alcohol. You're smoking. You are doing all these things. And as a result, you need to take these things out of your diet and reform. You need to change. These are the things now you have to do. So having been revived, the doctor prescribes to this individual. Now he's, a, he's revived, you know. So now he doesn't need a second person to revive him anymore because now he's up. And in order to change his life, reformation is now up to him. It is for him to follow the instructions that is laid out for him to follow. So we should have an idea of revival and reformation. 
Revival is something that God has to help us to accomplish. He has to send something, someone, some persons to revive us. But to reform, that is up to us. And we cannot be saved without revival and reformation. So the Lord does his part. He gives the instruction and he lays it out to us now. Will you be reformed? And now reformation will be essential for you not to have to go over revival. Because you can have another heart attack if you don't change your lifestyle. The next heart attack you get, there's no guarantee that revival will be there to help you again. So I hope that we understand the concept of revival and reformation. No. Inspiration in Review and Arrow. God calls for a thorough purification of households and institutions. There is need not merely of a revival, but of a reformation. Every church needs to be stirred as never before. So while revival is good, people can have access to revival. The question is, Will they be reformed? And every church now needs reformation. This is the difficult part, you know. It is one to be revived. But to be reformed is to change your entire life. And when the doctor comes and prescribes a reformation, the antidote to be changed to not having to go over that experience again, that is where you will have the problem. And that is always a challenge for people. Reformation is now where people have problem. That is the issue with a lot of people. Will they be reformed? So that is the issue where people will have a problem. So we should understand what revival is and what reformation is. No, we're going to continue. So the churches need reformation. Every church needs it. And she said households need it. Institutions need it. But people are more concerned about administering revival to people. All right, let's continue. There is need of true reformers. So when we're talking about reformation, no, you know, a lot of people who are health practitioners are believing health, health reform. They talk about health reform, but you cannot understand health reform unless you are, understand revival. If you don't understand revival and you undertake reformation, you are going to become a fanatic. And this is why a lot of people who attempt health reform without understanding the process of revival go off because revival and reformation goes hand in hand. Now, inspiration says, there is need of true reformers who will point transgressors to the great law giver. And teach them that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. There is need of men, mighty in the scriptures. Men whose every word and act exalts the law of Jehovah. Men who, in this time of apostasy and unbelief, labor to strengthen the faith of their fellow men in the law and the prophets. Teachers are needed, oh so much, to inspire hearts with reverence and love for the holy scriptures, which have been given for the admonition of us upon whom the ends of the world are come. So reformers are teachers, just like the doctor would administer the antidote for the individual to be saved. But the teacher cannot force the listener to change. The teacher can only expound counsel, plead, 
And these reformers, they are God-inspired reformers. They're not fanatics. They have been revived, and they're true teachers. No. Inspiration says, how many more years will it be before our brethren receive the clear, keen perception which calls evil, evil, and good, good? When will men cease to depend upon the same routine which has left so much work undone, so many fields and work? It is not, present, present, is not the present presentation enough to make men see that a revival, a revival is necessary and a reformation essential. So revival is necessary and a reformation essential. So while revival is necessary, reformation is essential. So revival is good, very good. But if you're not reform, you're going to need to be revived again. And it's a constant process that's going to go over until you're saved or you're lost. So we go back to the doctor. If you fall in the same category again, where you were not reformed and you get an heart attack again, you have to go back to the doctor again. And it's like young people. They make mistakes. You call them and you talk to them again. And you have to go over the same process that you did with them again. That's what the Lord has to do with us, you know. So it's a constant going over and over and over. And we cannot move forward because we make baby steps in revival, baby step in reformation, and we go over back. The only way we will not need to be revived again is unless reformation does its work. Reformation has to do, do its work. Then we are in a position to help others revive and reform. No. Inspirations, the Bible states the following. For the living know that they shall die. The living know that they shall die. But the dead know not anything. Neither have there any more a reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. A dead man cannot be revived and he cannot reform. Neither can he revive or reform anyone. So no. Sister White is now dead. That's her in her casket. So she's gone. She's dead. And her writings are left back for us as a guide. And she made a lot of statement about revival and reformation. And she says, God calls for a revival and reformation. The regular lines have not done the work which God desires to see accomplished. Let revival and reformation make constant changes. Something has been done in this line. But let not the work stop here. So here, Sister White, admit that God had accomplished revival and reformation in the past. And many people under her ministry were revived and reformed. And a lot of those people are sleeping now, awaiting the resurrection of the righteous. But she admitted that the work of revival and reformation cannot stop. It has to continue. And so by the time Sister White died, between her death and the arrival of the shepherd message, the church was in a bad condition and needed again to be revived and reformed. So she, having been gone from the scene, by the time Brother Houtif came on the scene, this is what he said in answer book three, Page 60, upon the death of Sister White in 1915, the gift of inspiration, the active, the active 
spirit of prophecy became quiescent, no longer manifesting itself for a time when the church does cut off from the very source of its life, as was the Jewish church from the death of the prophet Malachi to the rise of John the Baptist, how could it maintain its vitality and growth? Hence, now as then, there has followed the same inevitable spiritual malnutrition and deformity accompanied with a long train of woes. So just as the Jewish church had fallen in a bad state and John came and shot them with a revival, wake them up and then told them the antidote of reformation. So inspiration made clear that Sister White's death caused a death in the church. They just died with her. They stopped. And so God again had to wake them up to shut them. But the difference though is this. When the rod message came to bring life to them, to wake them up, it's just like a man that fainted and, you, and someone gets some water to throw on him or wet his face to get him to wake up. The church says, listen, we don't desire it. We don't want it. So they said they didn't want it. We don't need it. We don't desire it. So guess what? They could not be revived. And if someone is not revived, if someone gets a heart attack and they're laying on the street and they're in pain and you're trying to administer help to get them up and they say to you, get away from me. I don't need help. Move away. They cannot be revived and they cannot be reformed. So if they, in their bad condition, having Sister White's writings and think they can be reformed from reading it, they are going to just become fanatics, hell fanatic nuts and all the other nuts. They cannot understand what they're about because they cannot be reformed without being revived. And they are saying essentially to God, we have no desire to be revived. So there's a problem. Big problem. And inspiration continues. Timely greetings. Volume 1, number 40, page 16. If we are eager to shine, we must know, must know. And inspiration is telling us what we need to do. Arise and clean up. Put away, put away our black filthy garments and take an active part in this revival and reformation under the supervision of the Holy Spirit. You see that? So when the shepherd had message came, it was a message of revival and its contents had they been faithful, would have been reformed. They would have seen the doctor, Victor Houtif, and his instructions would have helped them to reform. And all of it would be done under, under the supervision of the Holy Spirit. But they said, we have no need for it. So inspiration continues. What was the result of their rejection? Stupidity, fanatism. They become fanatics and indifference must be abandoned and divine thinking put into action. So you see what was happening? Without revival and reformation, they became stupid, fanatics. They weren't thinking as divinely guided human beings. So there's a problem. And this is why Sister White had says revival is necessary. Reformation is essential. And they said to God, they don't need it. We don't want it. 
We have no desire for it. So with Sister White's writings, they became fanatics. And any human being that accept Sister White's writings and reject the rod message, they are not revived and they cannot accept or understand reformation. And that's a sad deception that they're in. So inspiration continues. Since inspiration, this is Jezri's letter, number three, page 12. I hope that I have not become your enemy, elders, for telling you the plain truth in the fear of God and for your own eternal good. Rather deal with the issues involved and do what you can to escape the overflowing scourge that is now at your door and at the door of everyone who fails to sigh and cry for the abominations that are in the midst. And that's Ezekiel 9. And we find that in Testimonies to the Church, volume 5, page 80 and 81. This, this, you note, this you note, this you note, is not Brother Houtif, but the layman's movement imbued with the spirit and at work. Sincerely yours for immediate action and for complete revival and reformation. So no, we cannot go to the start and the stop, the start and the stop, the start and the stop. He is saying the layman's movement will complete this revival and reformation. So with Sister White, when she died and Brother Hontif came on the scene, he administered revival and reformation. But something was going to happen to him also. He was going to die. So would the Lord then bring another prophet to start the process again? He said, no. The layman have to continue and do this work now. It is in the hands of the laymen to carry this out. How is he going to accomplish it? The Lord. He continues. Obvious it is, it is that God is commanded Jezreel, the firstborn of the three children, to speak to his brother Amai and to his sister Rahama, whose allegory, allegory are symbolical of the laity, both male and female. The mother whom they are commanded to reform. The mother whom they are commanded to reform is, of course, symbolical of the ministry. Of those who bring forth converts into the church family. The one to whom God speaks, Jezreel, therefore, is symbolical of a prophet. Here you plainly see that the revival and reformation does not come through the ministry, the mother, but through the laity, the children. And that the ministry, the mother, is, even, is in even greater need of reformation than the laity. For the mother is being accused of disloyalty and is by the children advised to reform. This is indeed a laity movement directed by the spirit of prophecy, by Jezreel's heaven-inspired effort and message. So the church cannot be reformed without the shepherd's word message. And it is the shepherd's word message that has to revive them. And it is the laity those who accept the shepherd word message who is going to revive them, administer the CPR. And when they revive, imbue this reformation in their mind and tell them, we don't want to go back to re revival again. We just want to reform and move forward. No, Brother Houtif himself too passed away. He died. 
And so this is why he made it clear that we have to get revival and reformation now from the laity. Is it as a, it's the laity inspired movement because he, the Lord knew, was going to put to rest. And so how is God going to accomplish this big work under the control of the Holy Spirit? This is something that will be done under the control of the Holy Spirit. And inspiration is going to continue. I hope, inspiration says, I hope that I have not become your enemy. And the red highlighted section brought out the point. The layman's movement imbued with the spirit and at work. This is a Holy Spirit controlled movement. And it is the laity, the children, that the responsibility is going to fall upon because our big brother, Jezreel, is gone. And it's now in the hands of the laity to administer revival and reformation. Revival and reformation that will not stop, that will actually accomplish success. So no inspiration says, Sister White had said, something had to be done in this line, but let not the work stop here. It had to continue. No, Brother Houtif, Isaiah 31, verse 7. For in that day, every man shall cast away his idol of silver and his idols of gold, which your own hands have made unto you for a sin. He says, the Assyrian is to fall because of his, the Assyrian is to fall because of his wickedness. Because of his wickedness and because God's people return to him because of a thorough revival and reformation. So, a laity inspired, spirit guided movement thoroughly turning to God through revival and reformation, and God sees that his people has finally turned to him. And he now caused Assyria to go down. And this spirit is a layman's movement imbued with the spirit, you know. This is not a, a democratic system. This is a theocratic imbued system, imbued with the spirit. Now, inspiration continues. Throughout these pages, the spirit of prophecy, as by the prophetic word, prove itself invulnerable to attack. It has vindicated itself, not as a voice beginning with Moses and ending before John the Baptist, but as the ever-living testimony. This is the shocker, you know. This is the wake up. This is a living voice, the living testimony to wake up the dead people. But as the ever-living testimony beginning with creation, and continuing with the patriarchs, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then with the prophets, next with the apostles, and finally with the messengers of the Lord in our own day, that's in Brother Hotif's days, you know, and on, rising higher and higher with each encounter. So this is the ever living shocker. God's people having imbued with the rod message to shock people with power, to get them to wake up and then reform. This is not a dead testimony, no. This is living people waking up those that are dead, dying. And this is now the lame men that, and women that has to do this because Sister White is dead and Brother Houtif is dead. This is why he said, this is the living person that has to go administer the CPR now. This is not the dead that's going to administer CPR. Inspiration is going to continue. It's the ever-living testimony. 
And this is what he said. Silas, Paul's companion in labor, was a tried worker gifted with the spirit of prophecy. So it's a spirit of prophecy at work through the living that has to go and revive these people and then turn around and administer reformation, not only to them, but to ourselves also, not going back again. This is a people who are revived and reforming intelligently, not turning back. No, inspiration continues. From the beginning, the church of God has had the gift of prophecy in her midst as a living voice to counsel, admonish, and instruct. We have now come to the last days of the work of the third angel's message, when Satan will work with increasing power because he knows that his time is short. At the same time, there will come to us through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, diversity of operations in the outpouring of the Spirit. This is a time of the latter rain. Not to interpret the prophecies because the last interpreter has come. But God has to give the gift to counteract the work of the enemy because it is the enemy's purpose to keep the people dead and sleeping. And God has to give his saints, the laymen, the power through the spirit of prophecy, the message that came with the Holy Spirit upon them to revive their brethren. Having revived these people, then you administer reformation. And so, this was Sister White writing to Jones in 1908. And so by this, Jones had gone off. And Sister White was reaching out to him to try to get him to revive and reform. But you know what? She's saying, this is the work of the living voice. And once people are revived, you're going to counsel them, admonish them, instruct them. That's no reformation. Inspiration continues. Let no one deceive himself by thinking that the Bible itself is the active spirit of prophecy. If you throw the Bible on a man that just had a heart attack, it cannot revive him. It's a living person that's going to do that. Now, if you go to school and you learn CPR, when you see someone having a heart attack, uh, they're in the water or the pool drowning and you pull them out, you bring to bear the knowledge that you've gained in school or what you've learned in the books. So when somebody is dying and you go to administer CPR, you are using the knowledge that you got from the spirit of prophecy both Brother Houtif and Sister White's writings. And you become the active agent to administer CPR to that individual. When the person is revived, you go in the same golden bowl and you tell them how they're going to reform. But you as the active agent has to do it, not the book. The Bible, you know, without the human challenge, channel, is as inactive as though it were but ink and paper. Moreover, the spirit too, apart from man, is also inactive. He too works through the human agent. Hence, without an inspired interpreter, the concealed prophecies and spirit that unfolds them are inactive. So here, Brother Otif was telling you, it is the spirit that caused him to interpret. Moreover, all could it be said of one particular group having the spirit of prophecy, when all sex in Christendom have the Bible. You see, if you have it, if you live it, if you believe it, you become the active agent to administer this revival, the CPR. No inspiration is going to continue. Men must themselves be under the influence of the Holy Spirit in order to understand the spirit utterances through the prophets. So you have to have the Holy Spirit upon a person that is being taught for them to understand the teacher that has the Holy Spirit also 
If both don't have the Holy Spirit, there's a problem. It is the Spirit that brings conviction. These messages were given, not for those that uttered the prophecies, but for those who are living amid the scenes of their fulfillment. It is for us. And so, revival and reformation has to be carried out by the laymen and women alive and living today. And this is why Sister White says, every home, every institution, every church needs revival and reformation as never before. And it has to be carried out by the living. But since the Shepherd Rod message came and brought revival and reformation, and since we have the inspired writings, the spirit of prophecy, and since we know that God's servants are dead, how are we as a people going to accomplish revival and reformation for ourselves? One, and it should be a hope that all of us are now revived and we're in the process of reforming our life. How are we then, in turn, going to revive our brethren in the church and ensure that they are reformed? And how do we know as individuals that we are actually reforming? That's another question too. Inspiration. And I'm going to give you the reference when we finish reading. Since Zechariah's prophecy met only partial fulfillment of the days of the Jews returned from Babylon to Jerusalem, and since his writing speaks interchangeably of another such movement, the which is to be greater than the former, there is therefore no doubt but that the latter is the antitype of the former. Hence, the revival and reformation of Zechariah's time is to repeat in our time. The builder's failure to continue with the work and to bring revival and reformation before Agai and Zechariah were called to the prophetic office and their success after God through the prophets took over perfectly demonstrates that without the living spirit of prophecy in the midst, no revival and reformation efforts can succeed. And that is why they all heretofore have failed. No dead person can revive anyone. This is the living spirit acting upon the living human being, trying to revive the living who are in need of reform. And this is the spirit of prophecy manifesting itself, the written words in the living agent, carrying out the practice of trying to revive the spiritual dead. Let me repeat. This is the spirit of prophecy, the words, the ink and paper in the living human being, manifesting itself in the life of the living, going at work to revive the dead. And without this manifestation in the midst of us, there can be no revival or reformation. And this is why the church, without the rod message, cannot be revived. And this is why, too, we who are listening to this as a people cannot be reformed. Because inspiration is saying it is the living spirit of prophecy that will accomplish this, not books. Book is just ink and paper. This is the living people. Inspiration continue. The type also perfectly demonstrates that since God has now arisen, since he has now arisen from his holy habitation and has taken the reins in his own hands, revival and reformation is sure to triumph. It is therefore useless to agitate revivals and reformations while one knows not what and how actually to revive or to reform. It is commendable to all of the standard, but it certainly is not in God's order for one to work up something and call it revival and reformation. He's saying that's not how revival and reformation works. And he's going to give us the antidote. 
He continues, in conclusion, let us summarize two main points which our study of the afternoon has definitely made clear to us. One, that a work and movement similar to those of Zacharias' day is successfully to bring revival and reformation among God's people of today. That those who expect the promised blessings must all heartedly enter into it. Two, that without the living spirit of prophecy in our midst, there can be no success in any revival and reformation. And that the sooner we know it, the quicker we shall achieve our goal. No dead person can revive anybody. And no dead person cannot reform anybody. It has to be the living. But this is not the spirit of prophecy to interpret. This is the problem many have. This is the spirit of prophecy guiding. This is the spirit of prophecy inside a human being, a living manifestation of what is written. Inspiration says, again, the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. The dead cannot revive you and the dead cannot reform you. It is only the living can do this. Sister White, God calls for a spiritual revival and a spiritual reformation. Unless this takes place, those who are lukewarm will continue to grow more and more abhorrent to the Lord until you refuse to acknowledge them as his children. And so unless these people get help, they are going to become worse and worse until God cannot help them or do anything for them. It is a living agency that has to do this work. God continues. Listen to what he says. Since it is the rod message that brought revival, and since it's the individuals that accept this rod message in their life that has to bring this message to their church brethren to revive them with it, shock them, get them up in love. What are we then as a people that have accepted this rod message really going to be reformed? That's the question. Are we going to be reformed? Inspiration tells us one way. It says, and let me, uh, let me read it slowly. If the same principles of piety and justice that were to guide the rulers among God's people in the time of Moses and of David were also to be followed by those given the oversight of the newly organized church of God in the gospel dispensation, Acts of the Apostle, page 95. And if man cannot approve, improve upon God's governmental rule, man cannot improve, don't try to help God, then why should we not pattern after it? And they had theocracy. They didn't have democracy, you know. Hence, the need of a revival and reformation. We need to revive and reform. We come out of the church with our democratic idea. We accept the right message. But when we accept the truth, we have to be reformed from our man-made thinking ideas. He continues. As restorers of every divine institution, we are glad to announce to the readers of present truth that besides the literature of revival, that's a shepherd of literature, you know, they may now also obtain that of reformation, our organizational publication, the Leviticus of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. Here God is telling us that the only way the Vidians are going to be reformed is unless they follow the instruction in the Leviticus. The literature of the shepherd message did revive us. But for us to be reformed, we have to 
follow the organizational publication, the Leviticus. Now, what does the Leviticus tell us that we should do? That is the problem. We all have been revived by the literature of the rod. But inspiration is telling us now that we have a problem. We are trying to fix God governmental standard and all of us need reformation in this. And this is the only thing that's going to bring reformation amongst God's shepherd or believers. This is the book. We cannot be reformed without it. Impossible. This is what he said that's going to bring reformation amongst us as a people. This book. What does the book say? God calls for a thorough purification of all souls. There is need of reformation. Every church needs it. No, every Adventist church practice democracy. So all of them need it. All of them need this book. All of them. And that's a problem. Big problem. Big, big problem. If this is the book that calls for reformation throughout the Adventist world, this book, Brother Hotev tells us, he says, let me read it again. If the same principle of piety and justice that were to guide the rulers among God's people in the time of Moses and of David were also followed by those given the oversight of the newly organized church in the gospel dispensation, that's Acts of the Apostles, page 95. And if man cannot improve upon God's governmental rule, then why should we not pattern after it? Hence, the need of a revival and reformation he continues, as restorers of every divine institution, we are glad to announce to the readers of present truth that besides the literature of revival, they may now also obtain that of reformation or organizational publication, the Leviticus of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. He is saying, without this literature, without us following it, we cannot be reformed. It doesn't matter how we try. Impossible. It is not the health message alone that's going to reform you. He's saying, a matter of fact, the health message cannot reform you in its true essence. You have to have this. Then those who come under this will administer the health message. This book. This is the book. Without it, we are doomed. And what every church needed, everywhere needed. And he says, firstly, are we going to be reformed? This association shall be known provisionally as the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. Not the general association, you know. You want reformation? He's saying, this is what you have to do. This is the name. Anybody that has the name, the General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, they are not reformed as yet. They're doing their own thing. Inspiration continues again. The object of this association is to bring among God's people that reformation called for in testimonies for the church. So the object of this association, this is the Leviticus, you know, it is the association that will cause reformation in the Adventist church. This is the Leviticus. It is only by following the Leviticus that we will be reformed. Yes, the message of the rod came and revived us, but we cannot be reformed without the Leviticus. He continues, Sister White is dead. Brother Hotif is dead. But they have left the messages for us. Next thing, reformation we are on, you know. Article 4, Officers and Their Duties, Section 1. The regular officers of this association 
This is not irregular, you know. This is the word regular. Officers of this association shall be a president, a vice president, a secretary, and a treasurer. All other officers of this association shall be appointed, not elected, you know, by vote. If we don't follow this, we are not reformed and we cannot be reformed. And he said, let me go again. Reformation can only be carried out, you know. He said, you want to be reformed? Go to the organizational manual, the organizational publication. He said, that is the only thing that's going to help you all. You all have been revived, but you follow the customs of the place that you used to live in before you were revived. So you came from the SDA church with the same kind of thinking. And having been revived, you refuse to be reformed. And this is reformation. This is it. And inspiration is telling us that it is the object of this association to get it in the people's brain that they have to be reformed. So, this is a, another challenge for a lot of people who accept the message. And so, this is a problem for them to be reformed. And listen what Brother Inspiration continues as Shepherd Rod, Book 2, page 227. The Reformation by Luther could not be considered here. We're not talking about Luther's Reformation here. He says, we are not dealing with that right here. For it was only a revival. It was only a revival to the message delivered before his time. It was just old truth he had coming back. Said Luther, the just shall live by faith. Knox, Wesley, and Campbell could not enter into in the parable, for they too had only a call for reformation. You know what he said reformation means? Brother Hotev puts it in bracket. Reformation means obedience. When someone has a heart attack and they go to the doctor and the doctor revive them, administer revival or someone from the ambulance come out and revive them and the doctor talks to them to get them reformed, the only way they're going to be reformed, unless they're obedient, the doctor might tell them, you have to stop smoking. You have to stop drinking. And if they're not obedient, they're going to get another heart attack. So Brother Hotif is telling us the word reformation means obedience. And you have to be obedient to what is in the Leviticus. If you're not obedient to it, you cannot be reformed. And he says, obedience to the message, the doctrines. Deliver to the Gentiles, the early Christian church. So he's saying, you see what happened in the early Christian church? You see what happened to the apostles? Who voted for Luther? Who elected him by vote? Who elected by vote Knox? Who elected by vote Campbell? Who elected by vote William Miller? Who elected these people? They weren't elected. They were God-appointed servants. And so, this election business that has taken us over, God is saying it can't work. That is not in the Leviticus. A matter of fact, we can't even amend it without the Spirit. So we have a big problem. And this is why inspiration says, without the living spirit of prophecy in our midst, there can be no success in revival or reformation. And the sooner we know it, the quicker we shall achieve our goal. And the regular officers is a president, a vice president, a treasurer, a secretary. And he says, don't try to even improve on what God has put down. 
You live it, follow it, or go and live your life in the world and enjoy sin and lose your salvation. But we cannot say today that God did not talk to us. God is saying to us, you cannot be revived without the rod message. And you cannot be reformed without following the Leviticus. Try as you may, you're doomed to lose your soul. And a reformation is obedience. Revival is necessary, but reformation is essential. We have to go to the Leviticus. We have to follow it. We have to live it. We have to obey it. And so, I don't know how much more plainer God could be. He's pleading with us. He's trying to help us. We continue. Disassociation. Disassociation. And this is what he's going to say again. Inspiration is speaking to us again. Disassociation shall hold regular sessions. So, sorry, shall hold regular sessions at such time and place as the executive council shall designate by public, by, by public, by a, sorry, by a notice published in the symbolic code, the official organ, the official organ of the organization in two successive issue before the date of the opening of the session. Listen, regular session. Special sessions may be called in the same manner in which a regular session is called. The decisions at special sessions shall have the same force as those at regular, should be at regular sessions. No inspiration is going to continue. So we have the regular officers, our president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and you can have regular sessions. Most Davidians hold regular sessions and they know what the word regular mean. They like to keep sessions to vote for officers. But here inspiration says too, that the regular, the same word regular, you know, the regular officers is the president and they don't want to accept that regular, but they accept this regular. They accept regular sessions and they love the word regular, but they disregard this word regular for president. And here God is saying, He's not playing our games. He's not in the games. He continues. Membership of this association shall be composed only of persons who subscribe to the old credenda, the creed, the instructions, the old credenda, and embody in their lives the old agenda of the aforesaid association. So you're going to be reformed. Everything that's in the Leviticus, you're going to follow it. It becomes a part of you. It is embodied in your life. You believe it. You believe if the Lord says regular, it means regular. It means exactly what he says. And he continues. Now, since it is now clear as sunlight that the ever unfolding inspired interpretation of the scriptures is the ever-living spirit of prophecy, the eyes of the church at work. Then, to be without these spiritual eyes is to try to walk, as it were, in dense darkness. God is saying, listen, this is not dead people I'm talking to, you know. This is ever-living people, people that are alive, successive people, a people that are living. If one dies, the Lord chose some others. And this is the spirit of prophecy at work in living, not dead people. And this is an ever living movement. One dies, a next person comes, a next set, a next set, a next set. And the Lord must have people in his church, eyes at the church at work. And without these spiritual eyes, you're doomed to fail. How can dead people see for us today? How can dead people revive? How can dead people reform? How can dead people hold regular session? How can living revive people tell God 
that they will accept some of the Leviticus and throw in the garbage other parts that they don't want. It doesn't work like that. We cannot get reformation like that. And so, inspiration again is warning us. God calls a man to do a certain work. And when he has carried it as far as he is qualified to take it, the Lord brings in others to carry it still farther. It is a living that revives. And it is by following the Leviticus of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association that we will be reformed. There's no other way. None. None. And for time's sake, and since we're going to post this study, let me go and see. For time. Let me just skip this and go to this statement for time. The science of the process finds, and let me go for everyone slowly. The science of the process finds close analogy in that of the of the universally used electric current. Electricity goes into action only when the live wire, the positive, comes in contact with the ground wire, the negative. So it is that the churches connect contact with God's chosen instrument, the ground wire. It's the human being, you know, fused to the spirit of God, the live wire, which together represents the positive and the negative is what electrifies the church and thus opens the line of communication between the church and heaven. And this is the children, the laity, imbued with the spirit of God, the spirit at work, live wire, grown wire, to go to the brethren and revive them. And when they revive, point them to the Leviticus to say, listen, you are not going to live like you live in the SDA church. We're not going to fight and war and argue over position and cut each other's throat. We're reformed people. We're a different people. And we follow what the Lord has said. And so the ordained instrumentalities of God, ordained instrumentalities of God, are almost entirely lost sight of. God has instituted no new method of reaching the children of men. If they cannot cut themselves off from heaven's appointed agencies to reprove their sins, correct their errors, and point out the path of duty, there is no way to reach them with, a, with any heavenly communication. So God has instrumentalities, appointed agencies. This is why Brother Hotel says in the Leviticus, all other officers of this association are appointed. That is a difficulty for us to get. We like to vote for people. We like to put our friends in position. And that is not reformation. So go back, folks. Go back and read. In other words, not before the Lord took the reins in his own hands through the spirit of prophecy did the work prosper. In fact, Sacred history proves that nothing has ever prospered in God's work without the living spirit of prophecy in its midst. And the spirit of prophecy are the Holy Spirit that imbues man to speak. It is the same spirit that has to be working upon the living to revive anyone. And when those individuals are revived, they follow the Leviticus as it reads exactly they don't tamper with it and that's what brings reformation let no one deceive himself by thinking that the bible is the active spirit of prophecy no book you throw on a dead spiritually dead person can revive them so my brothers and sisters go back and read the Leviticus. Pray that God will open your eyes as you read the Leviticus of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. Inspiration is telling us that is the only way we're going to achieve reformation.
And this is what inspiration says. A disciple is one who follows Christ on and on in divinely revealed truth, which he accepts, not because others do or do not, but because the Father which is in heaven, as true his spirit, personally convince him of it. Matthew 16, 17. Because independent of what others do or say, he is personally persuaded by the spirit and the testimony is his living word passed on by his chosen spirit-filled messengers, the spirit of prophecy at work. Hence, to bind up the testimony among his disciples is to confirm the spirit of prophecy among them and them only. So listen, you get this dead man resurrected from his spiritual debt, and it is now your objective to say to him, listen, you have to reform now. You have to change. You have to be a better man. You have to overcome. You have to stop all you were doing before. And so, if we don't comply, we cannot be saved. We cannot. And so, again, to emphasize, when you go for the antidote to the doctor, after you have been revived, the doctor is saying, listen, this is what you have to do. You have been revived from your spiritual debt. You're almost dead. And the man is saying, Doc, what do I need to do now? Because I really need to live. The doc said to him, listen, go home and read the Leviticus and follow exactly what it says. The name of the association is going to be the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association. It's like the doctor telling him, you have to go to the gym. And this is the name of the gym you're going to go to. You're not going to go to the gym. That is called the General Association. That is not the gym that you need to go. So now you're going to get what you call therapy. He said, yes, doc, I will listen. All right. The doc says again, when you go for therapy, you hear what I tell you? The regular people that's going to treat you there, when you go to this Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association, and he says, ooh, doc, he said, you should have a president there, a vice president, a secretary, and a treasurer. Okay, doc, I understand. They will also tell you that you have to follow the health principle. Okay, doc, I understand. So now, if you fail to do that, it means we have to administer CPR on you again. We have to go and teach you the shepherd that message over until you get it. He said, no, doc, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be obedient. Doc says, once you understand reformation, you're going to go to your brethren and administer CPR on them. Yes, Doc, I see. So, brothers and sisters, I hope we are clear what God is trying to get us to understand. The rod message came to revive us. And Brother Hauti says, folks, go to the Leviticus. And as a laity, that's how we're going to get help. If we try doing our own thing, we're in deep, deep trouble. So may God bless us and help us. May God open our eyes to see and follow what he has said. And once this man walks out of the doctor's office, he should be a revived and reformed individual. And he does not need anyone to tell him about reformation again because he's going to follow the liberty course as he reads and he's not going to play games. He's not going to try to help God. And the doc will say, you see, I'm looking in your face and talking to you. You have to do it. God is depending on you. So, my brothers and sisters, may we not fail God May we do exactly what he has instructed us to do. And I'm going to close 
with this thought. No. Inspiration says the following. And I'll read in your ear to close. Here you see the remnant those who are left after the others are swallowed by the earth, so to, so to speak, keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. This remnant are sick that keeps the commandment of God, therefore, is the only one that inspiration recommends, the only one that is worth joining, the only one that can profit anyone. It alone possesses the power to escape any and all of the calamities that are now brewing throughout the world. It is the only sect that finds favor with God. No other would do, for no other could profit you. Then, too, it alone has the testimony of Jesus Christ, the living spirit of prophecy in its midst, the spirit who leads into all truth who alone can rightly interpret the scriptures. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, plainly then inspiration would have you join no sect but this remnant, the only ones who follow the Leviticus, exactly as it reads, the only one that has a president, a vice president, a secretary, and a treasurer, the only ones that believe in the living spirit of prophecy, that the same spirit who moved upon Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who moved upon Noah, and Sister White, and Brother Hotif, the same spirit moves upon his people today in this association, the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association. And now, we rest our case, and we beg you, we plead with you and ask you to please, please go and read the Leviticus. Don't be of those who needs to be revived and reformed again. And we close with that. No, because of time and we're on the road <clears throat> And we have to go give another study right, right after this. We can only pray. And I'm very sorry. We can only pray and close. So God bless you, God's people. May his face shine upon you. May he give you peace. And may you have courage to do what's right. In the sight of heaven. And not in the sight of man. Curse be the man that put his trust in man and make flesh his arm. Let us pray. Great Father in heaven, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God who knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end, we pray that you'll bless us and keep us and cause your face to shine upon us and grant us your peace and that you'll save us in your rests. We leave all in your hands and in your care. And we pray that you will give us the courage to follow exactly as you lead because you know what's best. And the sooner we revive and reform, the sooner will Assyria fall and the work ends. To Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Rise up my